The Art of Being Ruled. Wyndham Lewis. Original Publication 1926. 1989 Edition. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Part 11. Proudhon and Rousseau. Chapter 2. The War Between the Different Socialisms. But Marx, on his side, has nothing to complain about on the score of the bouquets he receives from his fellow revolutionaries. And in conjunction with the above attack on Proudhon the following remarks by Bakunin are interesting, I take them from a little account of Bakunin appearing in the Spur Glasgow Library, Michael Bakunin, Communist, 6D. I respected him, Marx, much for his learning and serious devotion, always mixed, however, with personal vanity, to the cause of the proletariat. I sought eagerly his conversation, which was always instructive and clever, when it was not inspired by a petty hate, which, alas, happened only too often. He called me a sentimental idealist, and he was right. I called him a vain man, perfidious, and crafty. And I, also, was right. Personal vanity, Marx says in the passage quoted on the opposite page, was the cause of Proudhon's shortcomings. Bakunin evidently considered that this was the characteristic failing of Marx. Again, Marx, in the same paper, attacks Proudhon as an amateur, as it were, in the theories they both were so famous for. He writes. Proudhon, on the other hand, says of Rousseau, in attacking his social contract, not a word has he to say either about work, about property, or about the forces of industry. Rousseau does not even know what economy is. His program pays attention exclusively to political rights, economic rights are not recognized by him. But Mr. Shaw, in his telling way, refers as follows to Marx in his Methuselah preface. Marx was by no means infallible, his economics, half borrowed and half homemade by a literary amateur, were not, when strictly followed up, even favorable to socialism. His theory of civilization had been promulgated already in Buckle's History of Civilization. There was nothing about socialism in the widely read first volume of Das Kapital, every reference it made to workers and capitalists showed that Marx had never breathed industrial air, and had dug his case out of blue books in the British Museum. Compared to Darwin, he seemed to have no power of observation, there was not a fact in Das Kapital that had not been taken out of a book, nor a discussion that had not been opened by somebody else's pamphlet. Marx possessed, however, luckily for his success, terrible powers of hatred, invective, irony, and all the bitter qualities bred, first in the oppression of a rather pampered young genius, Marx was the spoilt child of a well-to-do family, by a social system utterly uncongenia, to him, and later on by exile and poverty. From the point of view of the militant socialist, the immense glass house of prosperity and success in which Mr. Shaw so genially dwells would not have been a difficult mark for the invective and irony of the pampered genius thus demolished. To imagine Marx's rejoinder is not very difficult. We can, without unduly stretching the imagination, assume, therefore, that Mr. Shaw is lying in the dust beside Proudhon, Marx, and the rest. To me, by far the most interesting of these sectarian battles is the well-known attack on J.J. Rousseau in the Idée Générale de la Révolution. It seems to me of such great importance in the region of ideas of which the present essay treats, that I will give an outline of it, quoting a few of the most important passages.